it's easier to get people into something if you break the process down a little bit. So if you're trying to help me lose 50 pounds and your first solution for me is to dive into a marathon where I'm going to have to spend months and months training and four hours running and all that, it's just a huge commitment. But if you start with some baby steps of say like, hey, we know you want to get healthy, but let's just um, get you started. Let's get you started on that path. You're just going to make a commitment to become healthy and we're going to give you this first baby step of going out for a walk every day or, or whatever it is. This is Evolve CPG, a community of purpose-driven brand leaders who not only believe in better, but actively pursue it. That's better products, better brands, and better leadership for a better world. I'm your host, Gage Mitchell, founder and creative director of Modern Species, a sustainable brand design agency helping better brands grow and scale their impact. On today's episode, instead of a conversation with a guest, I'm going to break down a book I recently read by discussing how the lessons apply to branding. Today, we're going to be talking about what I'm calling persuasive branding, and it's essentially taking six psychology principles and applying it to your brand. These psychology principles are going to be coming from the book Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion by Robert Cialdini. If you haven't read that book yet, I recommend it. It's been recommended to me by a ton of marketers and psychologists. And anytime I'm talking about how you kind of use behavior design or the psychological principles to really get people to live into the things they want to live into. And of course, as mission-driven brand people, we're out there to help people. So you got to use all the tools in the toolkit, right? So let's break this book down a little bit and apply it to brands. So the first principle in the book is called reciprocation, and they describe it as the old give and take and take. Essentially, what they're saying is that when you give something to somebody, a gift, let's say at an airport um, or a, you know, loan somebody a dollar or whatever, they're that much more likely to want to give something back to you. So therefore, why they say the take and take is that you can ask for even more than you gifted them. You might have just given them a dollar to help them get something out of a vending machine, but then you ask them to donate $50 to a nonprofit. They're going to feel compelled to do that because you gave them something. So of course, as marketers for good, we're going to focus not on taking too much, but using some of that leverage to benefit our purpose, our mission, our brand. So first off, I think this is just a general business principle that everyone should follow is we need to be solving a real problem, not just trying to sell something that people don't need. But I think this fits in the principle of reciprocation because when you're solving a real problem for someone, you're giving them something. You're giving them a solution to their pain. And that's going to, of course, turn into them wanting to give you something back, a.k.a. their brand loyalty. Another good example is free samples of, of your newest products. A website that does this well is Social Nature. They help brands reach new audiences or launch new products by offering them a coupon or something to go get that new product at a store for either free or discounted or something. And the idea behind that is, you know, I might be a little hesitant to try your product, but you gave me a free sample. I'm going to feel pretty good about you, and I'm going to come back and buy more products, of course, if the product is good. Another idea that you could use for reciprocation is bonus goodies in your e-commerce uh, shipping boxes. So I go to your website, I buy three products. When I get the box at home and I open it up, not only do I get my three products and they're all beautiful and well-packaged, etc., but I open it up and there's an extra goodie in there, like a sticker or a, a sample of one of your new products or maybe a coupon to buy, get something free later. That little extra goodie is going to get me excited and make me want to come buy more stuff from you. And it's going to make me want to tell friends, which is another principle later. Another idea for reciprocation could be um, exclusive access to um, an event or some sort of experience or to content. For example, I've seen some brands put on, you know, concerts in a city like pop-up concert and they only invite people on their email list or Maybe there's um, specific content on your website that only true customers uh, have access to or 
anything like that, but basically you're, you're rewarding people. You're giving them something because you appreciate them and then they feel special and they want to keep supporting you as a brand. Uh, another one I've seen, I guess not as much recently, but more back in the old days when you had to fill out a little customer loyalty card with your birth date and address and all that kind of stuff. But they're, uh, Birthday surprises, I think, are just kind of a nice little personal touch that, you know, I I don't personally know you as a brand, but when you send me a note that says, hey, we know it's your birthday and we're going to buy you an ice cream or something like that, that's just such a nice touch of a gift that it's going to make me feel good about you and make me want to uh, give back in return, whether that's referring you to friends or coming in and buying a lot more than what you just gave me. So again, remember, Tip number one is reciprocation. Let's go go on to number two. So tip number two is commitment and consistency. They describe it in the book as hobgoblins of the mind. I would basically quickly describe it as when somebody makes a decision, they want to act in such a way that upholds that decision, that, that makes it true. So essentially, if I make a decision that I'm a a healthy person, I'm going to want to work out. I'm going to want to eat healthy. I'm going to want to do those kind of things to not look like a liar. I'm going to want to lean into behaviors that support my commitment. So the way this might work for brands, um, especially brands that are trying to make a difference in people's lives, first tip I would say is kind of leaning in on behavior design principles where the it's easier to get people into something if you break the process down a little bit. So if you're trying to help me lose 50 pounds and your first solution for me is to dive into a marathon where I'm going to have to spend months and months training and four hours running and all that, it's just a huge commitment. But if you start with some baby steps of say like, hey, we know you want to get healthy, but let's just um, get you started. Let's get you started on that path. You're just going to make a commitment to become healthy and we're going to give you this first baby step of going out for a walk every day or, or whatever it is. But the point is that the more they take steps through that commitment, the more the easier it gets, the more motivation they have, and the more likely it is that they'll keep going to fulfill that consistency because they made a decision that they're going to get healthy. Another idea is if you have just a generic form on your website for whatever reason, what if you added some leading questions on that form? Maybe you ask people, hey, why is it that you care so much about getting healthy? The physical act of them writing down their why statement of why they want to be a healthy person or why they are a healthy person or whatever makes them kind of, you know, the act of getting it in writing makes them want to fulfill it, makes them want to Um, act in ways that um, are consistent with that statement. So if you're a brand that happens to sell stuff that can help support them in those goals, you just getting them to write it down really makes them kind of firm it up in part as part of their identity. And then, you know, ideally they'll feel good about you and want to keep moving forward to the next steps. So maybe another idea could be uh, pledges or challenges. So again, let's just keep on this. I want to get healthy trend. If your company, you know, is either part of or starts a a pledge that's like, I'm going to, you know, cut out meat two days a week or one day a week to start up to five days a week at the end of this pledge or challenge, I'm making that commitment. Maybe I'm signing my name on something uh, publicly where other people can see it. I'm going to participate in this. I'm going to post on social media. The more I've publicized that commitment, the more likely it is that I'm going to follow through on that. And again, if your brand is out there to help people achieve their goals, then by the end of this, they're going to hopefully have had great motivation and so on and so forth, but they're also going to see you as a solution for continuing that behavior down the road. Another example I'll bring up for commitment and consistency is subscription plans. Now, this is just generally popular right now in the direct-to-consumer kind of business model, but the way you can look at it here is that I am much more committed if I click subscribe to get this once a week or once a month because I have at that point made a decision 
that this product is so important to me that I want it regular. I don't even have to think about it. I just want it to show up at my door. <laughs> Whether or not I know I need it, it's going to keep coming. And the reason that's powerful is that there's a big difference between buying something once and then remembering to order it again, you know, by the time the first one runs out or whatever, um, and just knowing that it's automatically going to come. And there's a little bit of a block in like wanting to cancel that subscription because once they're committed, once they've made the decision that that product is important, there it's harder to go and cancel it than it would be to um, go and order it again, if that makes sense. All right, so another idea is down payments. Um, so you see this, I guess Tesla maybe does this a lot where it's one thing to say, yes, I want to buy the new car that's coming out in two years. It's another thing to say, okay, I will put $5,000 down right now because I'm that committed. Once I've invested money, once I've signed a piece of paper, once I've made a public pledge, whatever, I'm that much more likely to follow through with whatever it is that I said I'm going to do. Granted, sure, if you give them easy outs to get their money back, you know, so on and so forth, it breaks down. But the idea is if you're trying to get them to commit to doing something big, a down payment, a name on a piece of paper, you know, a, a written pledge, uh, anything like that is going to help um, build some momentum. All right, psychology tip or principle number three, social proof. They describe it as truths are us. Uh, I don't know if this one needs explanation since I think it's pretty common in branding and marketing, but the idea for brands and markets is that people like us do things like this is what how Seth Godin describes it. And the idea is that uh, you want to kind of fit in with your pack, your, your people, um, your community. So if you see people like you, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're a fitness advocate or whether you're a hunter, or whether you're um, a foodie, whatever, when you see other people that fit those labels, doing something, buying something, talking about something, you also want to do or buy or talk about that thing. So this one, you know, kind of goes without much description, but some, some paths towards this would be target customer testimonials, for example. Like if you have testimonials on your website and your emails and your whatever, and the closer that person is to me, aka your target, the more likely it is to have an effect on me because I see them have as having chosen your product, A, and B, liked it enough to write a testimonial. They did my research for me. I no longer need to do it. So that's how powerful social proof is. A few other examples. Influencers and product placements, for example. That's why they work, because I look up to that person, I want to be that person, or I think I am like that person, and they like your product. They mention your product, so I'm going to also or buy your product. Um, it's being shareworthy, I think, is a huge one, because that's the free <laughs> social proof, right? If you just make the product experience, the product quality, the unboxing, you know, whatever, the whole thing, if you if you make it something special that I either want to take a picture of or immediately tell my friends about or or post online, make a YouTube video about, then I'm going to give you free social proof because I'm going to just tell everyone about it. And all you had to do is make something really awesome. Then, of course, you could also say like press, TV interviews, articles and magazines, speaking engagements at events. Those all kind of fit within social proof because the the organizer of said events or the the publisher of said magazine thought you were worthy enough to write about. Therefore, you must be awesome. One fun example I've seen about this, and this was a while ago, but um, I my I knew someone who had a coworker who, you know, super hardcore. Uh, I believe it was, uh, you know, conventional food eater, like meat eater, all this kind of stuff, just like the exact opposite of what most of us in this uh, Better for the World product industry are, are promoting. But they didn't believe in any of the sustainable food, any organic, any vegetarian, any anything. But they read an article in Men's Health magazine about why organic might be important because it, you know, it, as a hunter or as a fitness advocate or as a you know, whatever, they gave you all these reasons why it might be important. All of a sudden, that person decided, oh, well, maybe it's not so bad after all, because people like me are starting to talk about it. 
Another uh, way you can bring this to life is through brand collaborations. Now, this needs no explanation per se because it's already pretty popular, but the way it works is that you associate your brand with a brand that people already like. Maybe they've never heard of you, but they really love this brand. You collaborate with them. That brand now lends their credibility to you. And their customers are like, well, if, if a brand I love loves this brand, then I probably also love this brand. All right, so again, that one didn't need much explaining, but let's dive into uh, principle number four, which is liking. They call it the friendly thief. <laughs> and I think the reason they describe that is that it, if you like somebody, you're often willing to go um, to agree to things that, that uh, do not benefit you in any way just because you like that person and want to make them happy. Uh, an example they used, which I think will be helpful for the examples coming up here, are like a car salesman that really builds rapport with you and talks about how much alike you two are and compliments you, makes you feel good, and then you know, when it comes to negotiation, you're going to be much softer on them because you like them and you want them to like you. So for brands, this means, you know, have a fun, personable, friendly presence. If you're, whether you're at a trade show, maybe you've got a booth at Coachella or something like that, but if the energy, the vibe, the whatever that your employees and your brand and whatever is putting out there is appealing to the, to the people attending said event, you're going to, be so much more popular people are going to want to do whatever they can for you because they just dig your vibe they like you a direct example of this is a, a client of mine yum butter when they were kind of a, a younger brand they at trade shows would just have music rocking they'd be dancing they'd be doing little crossfit exercises and so on and so forth as people walked by and people just were drawn into the gravity of their their energy and they liked them so much that i think it became a little bit of a, a cult brand for the industry just because people dug their vibe. It was they liked them, you know, they wanted to see them succeed. So another a few other examples would be like personalized communications. Like obviously if if I get a generic email, I'm less likely to pay attention to it. But if I've got an email that says, Hey Gage, we saw that you XYZ and we we know that you like blah blah blah. So we're gonna yada 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 um, because we we really like you and care about you. That's going to make me feel more special, which makes me like you because people like feeling special, right? Um, of course, this can has been overused and can be <laughs> done horribly, so choose your weapons wisely there and, and do it in ways that actually make sense, not just pandering. Uh, other great examples are great customer service. For example, like I somewhat recently got a uh, bad bag batch of a product that I normally love and they're normally great. And I, I messaged that company and I said, hey, just in case there's some sort of contamination issue or whatever, here's the lot number, here's what, what I experienced because, you know, I'm in the industry. I know they would like to know that information. And the way they responded instead of just a, hey, thanks for letting us know, they said, oh my God, you know, that, that's horrible. So sorry you had a bad experience. We really appreciate you as a customer. Here's a coupon to go buy to go get another free product which is great. It's kind of an expensive product. I was super psyched about it, but that great customer service, of course, made me like them more. And now, you know, I'm going to continue buying their product, even though I just had a bad experience with them. I'm going to want to buy it even more. Um, so another example is a little bit harder to tie into um, brands versus just individuals, but the idea of shared interests or experiences comes up. And that's back to that car salesman example where you know, if you go to the same church or you play the same sport or you're into the same kind of hobby or interests, um, you, you develop a little bit more of like an instant rapport or liking with that person because you feel like they must be like you, um, which, of course, people like, them, like people like themselves, which is um, odd but obvious, right? So anywhere that your brand can show that you have similar interests, so let's just say you make rock climbing gear, in all your social media and whatever, if you, the people working at the company, are out there on the rocks climbing out there in the wilderness or in gyms or whatever, um, tying on those ropes, like that's going to make me feel like, hey, you're one of us too. You're not just some brand trying to sell to me. You're my people. I might bump into you out on a mountain someday, and I like you. You're one of me, so I'm going to support your brand more. 
And then of course, help them feel good about themselves. Uh, you know, people like compliments, people like when you pay attention to them. So anywhere you can in your brand, um, pay attention to people, make them feel better about themselves. A good example, um, might, might've been like a uh, Tom shoes, for example, when they came out and offering their buy one, give one, it was a great example of conspicuous consumption because part of the reason people bought the shoes had nothing to do with the shoes. It was because they wanted to be the type of person that gave back to the community. So they wanted those Tom shoes because they were very obviously different looking, you know, with um, the style and the tag and whatever. And that by wearing those shoes, I'm a good person, you know, same with the, the Toyota Prius and so on and so forth. If you make people feel good about themselves, of course, they'll, um, want to keep supporting you as a brand. All right. So principle number five, this one is authority. They describe it as directed deference. I'm going to basically sum it up as people are more likely to follow an order or take a suggestion if it came from somebody in authority. Some classic examples might be like if somebody dressed as a cop tells you not to walk uh, through a crosswalk that's obviously already, you know, lit up and I, I can't, I know I can see the sign. I know I can walk through it, but a cop just told me not to walk for some reason. You know, I'm going to believe him compared to a stranger telling me that I'm going to be like, whatever, buddy. And I'm just going to keep walking. Right. So for brands, the way this principle works, as you've probably seen it is, uh, endorsements by experts would be one of the first things that comes to mind is if you're a product that's better for for you or for the world, like having some authority, some doctor, some PhD, some whatever, say, hey, this is important and this brand, this product or whatever is legit, then of course I'm 10 times more likely to believe it because that's an authority speaking on it. I don't need to do my research. They know a million times more than I do. Um, of course, for another way in our industry of the natural organic, you know, better for the world industry, there's a lot of pioneers in the industry. So uh, founder kind of thought leadership is a big way that people go about um, building this authority is like if you were one of the founding fathers of the organic movement or of getting hemp legalized or, you know, whatever else, then you are kind of an authority on that. And if you're at speaking conferences, if you wrote a book on the subject, if all those kind of things kind of tie into building authority. So you might not even need endorsements if you are an authority on it. Um, and even if you don't have a pioneering founder, you can lean in on research and educational content. Um, one of our clients boosts or um, really sells a lot of their supplement, supplements based on the fact that they've done more research on the subject than anyone else, and they share all that data and educate the community on the benefits of probiotics, for example. So uh, a couple other ways to use this authority principle would be third-party certification. So the reason USDA organic seal or whatever works is because people see that, they, they trust it, they know you didn't just slap that on your product, that you had to go jump through some hoops to get it. Therefore, you know, they can more easily believe your claims and know that you're a good product if you've had to go those that extra mile. And then, of course, uh, this is an interesting one and pers personal one that I've experienced is high status customers. So there's a major difference between me pitching my design services, having a bunch of clients you've never heard of versus me saying I've worked with brands like Organic Valley or Aveda or some of our more well-known clients because as soon as I say those names, people are like, oh, wow, okay, those are pretty big, established, successful brands, and if they trusted you, then I should be able to trust you because they probably did their homework. And the funny thing is it doesn't just appeal to other big brands, but like the smaller brands that see them as like where they want to go, you know, that works. So how can you do that? You could have celebrities that have bought your product, and even without an endorsement deal or a testimony or whatever, if you just see a picture online of a celebrity wearing your clothes or uh, using your products or eating your food or whatever, like just like retweeting that just gives you instant authority kind of access. And that's sort of um, social influence or whatever as well. Uh, but, you know, it's authority in cases where somebody believes, oh, that person knows what they're talking about. 
I'm going to buy that product too. All right, principle number six. We're almost there. Thanks for hanging in. So scarcity, the rule of the few is how they describe it. I don't think this needs that much explanation because I think we all get the idea that the fewer of something there is or the harder it is to get, the more you want it for whatever reason. It's just a human kind of psychology principle. So for brands, the way you might want to think about it is uh, limited quantity. If you're trying to sell 10,000 of something, it's going to be, you're going to be much more successful if you tell people, hey, we've only got 10,000 and they're gone when they're gone. We're not making it again. People are going to buy that much quicker than if you said, hey, we've got 100,000 of these because there's no rush. You know, okay, I, I want one, but like they're not going to sell out right away. Or if you're just going to keep making it over and over again. So you could make a series of limited edition products and, and just sell through those super quickly and then keep moving on to the next thing. Another popular method is seasonal offerings. So just think of the, what is it called? The pumpkin spice latte from Starbucks. The reason people go crazy about that every year may have nothing to do with whether or not they like it. It's just like, hey, this is the only time of year I can get this thing. So I'm going to go buy it. And of course, it does quite well for them. Um, invite only opportunities. The tech industry uses this principle or this idea a lot of, of scarcity is that if it's something that I can only get by knowing someone else or whatever, I'm more likely to sign up for it than if it was just open and public. So like the Clubhouse app that recently launched, most people wanted to get in there purely because it was exclusive and you couldn't get in there unless you knew somebody who was in there and you heard that there was these famous people in there. Um, so that principle obviously works quite well. Uh, flash sales. That's an obvious one, I think, as well, where if this is only on sale this day, this weekend or whatever, even if I wasn't for sure I'm going to buy that right now, I see a sale and it's going to be gone in two days. I'm going to have that FOMO. It's going to be gone. It's that whole scarcity thing, so I'm going to buy it. Um, and then, of course, um, another thought is, like, what if it's the only place it's available? For example, uh, what if, yes, I sell, like breweries, let's look at it that way. They sell their main beers that are just kind of like mass production at all these retail shops. You can get it at the bars, et cetera. But if you really want their super special limited edition, whatever, you can only get it at the brewery or at their website or whatever it is, then you're going to drive a lot of traffic to that brewery or that website because people want that scarcity. They want that limited edition kind of thing. Uh, so if you've hung on this long, good on you. Thanks for hanging in. This is a somewhat long breakdown, but uh, in recap, the six principles from influence the psychology of persuasion that we can apply to our brands to help people live better lives, to build a better world, etc., are reciprocation, commitment and consistency, social proof, liking, authority, and scarcity. Use those for good. Obviously, don't use those for evil like has been done in the industry quite a bit. But, you know, let's let's lean into how we can um, tap into the psychology of humans to help them become better, to help build a better world. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to dive deeper into this conversation and others like this one, join us at community.evolvecpg.com. Business can be a powerful force for good. Is your brand living up to its full potential? Visit EvolveCPG.com to learn about our new workshop, Exponentially Good, to scale your impact exponentially. Subscribe to our podcast and YouTube channel for more innovator interviews, expert advice, and leadership discussions. If you like this episode, leave a heart, thumbs up, or review, and share it with your colleagues. As an ever-evolving show, we also love feedback, so send us your thoughts or ideas for who we should talk to next to Evolve at modernspecies.com.